Good morning. Today we're going to be talking all about Firecracker and micro VMs. And I'm going to have a special guest join me from Weaveworks, Richard Case. I'm just going to bring him on now. Good morning, Richard. Good uh, morning. So um, you're working at Weaveworks at the moment. Uh, yeah, that's correct. Yeah, I work okay. at Weaveworks. Most people must be familiar with the company, the idea of GitOps and all the different um, open source projects it's had. Um, Alexis Richardson's been very vocal at KubeCon, big name. Um, how long have you been working there? Uh, about two and a half years now. Okay. What kind of stuff are you, are you involved in currently? Uh, yeah, so I, I don't work on the, the traditional side of, of, I guess, what WeVox, WeVox has done. So, um, so I've been working on uh, the bare metal side of Kubernetes, uh, building a particular solution for Kubernetes at the edge. Okay. And is that because, you know, it's fun if we look at things like Flux and Flagger and all the other open source projects that we've had in the past? Is, is, it, is it just kind of another thing to do? Um, uh, yeah, it is fun. I can't, I can't deny that. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it really exercises the gray matter. Um, but there is, there's a serious side to it. Um, so we are building this solution for a telco customer, um, uh, specifically around 5G and their network. Um, and they have a lot of cell towers at the edge. And so they want a, they want to run Kubernetes in all of these cell towers. Um, but they don't want to use, I, I guess, a traditional virtualization solution. So that's that's why we're building this. That's why we came to Firecracker. Okay, and that's kind of refreshing to hear about an open source project built because a customer needs it and is paying you for it. Um, it's kind of the the promised land of open source. So we've got people coming along for a journey today. Um, I can see Carlos from Berlin. We have Matt Franz, Zespray from Taiwan, Gokun Han. Good to see you, Han. Uh, contributes to FASD. Jack Corden said hi, Marcus Noble, Carlos Satana. Very early morning for you. Hope you've had your coffee. And he, he loves Kubernetes at the edge. So you're in good company today. Um, so I have, as you might have seen on Twitter, uh, pimped out a Raspberry Pi with 8 gigs of RAM and SSD. And we're going to be running Firecracker on it later. But the main thing we want to do is start with um, an overview of why you might be interested in this. Um, certainly, I hadn't really been thinking seriously about Firecracker, probably much like, I guess, you, Richard, before the project with um, the telco customer. Yeah, that's right. I never really heard of it. No. So, so why should people be interested in that? That's an interesting one. So I, I guess there are virtualization solutions that already exist, uh, open source and commercial. Um, the reason that we were interested in was uh, purely that it's very lightweight uh, from a resource point of view and very fast uh, from bringing up those those virtual machines. So those those two things combined uh, make it really attractive for a the solution we're trying to build, um, and uh, and I guess b it's open source as well, and, and you know it's actually underpins some some you know commercial services in aws that you know i use are you know a massive scale well what i'm going to do is start off by just saying uh ask questions as we go along this was new for us it's probably new for some of you um, so maybe you may be watching this later on, so you can reach out to me on Alex Ellis UK on Twitter. Um, the best two tweets of me and Richard or demo um, will get a T-shirt and I'll post that to you this weekend um, or I'll order the right size and get that posted to you. So um, do share. We like sharing. And now I'm going to take this banner off and pop up my screen. So... Let's start with this part of the presentation. Now, at the beginning, we're going to look at um, legacy VMs, v containers, v micro VMs. Now, I posted a, a lab onto Hacker News a couple of days ago, and people are asking these questions. So I want to try and cover them, but also give you a bit of a fundamentals there as well. Then we'll show you solutions for isolation. And Firecracker is not your only option. 
some of the alternatives available, um, the anatomy of a Linux host. So we're going to go very deep here. We're going to look at the kernel, the init process, what loads the drivers, what's required in a VM. And that's because when you work at this level, you have to sort of have a, a, a basic understanding of these things. We'll then take um, use cases. So companies that are commercializing Firecracker, um, people that are adopting it, things we think it could be useful for versus containers. And then we've got demos. So we're going to give you a demo early on of, of my Firecracker lab. This takes a container and converts it into a micro VM. We'll launch it, we'll have network access. And then um, we have a demo that I'm looking forward to. And it's going to be from Richard launching a Kuben bare metal Kubernetes cluster. And that's your liquid metal project, isn't it? Yeah, that's correct. Awesome. OK. So let's get on to the demos. The first one is the quick start. I've given you URLs here. The second one is going to be um, Richard's. And then the third, I'm going to swap the order, will be what we can do with GitHub Actions, um, combining that together. So if you'd like the slide, there's a lot of technical information here. If you want to learn from them, click the links. You can get them if you're a GitHub sponsor for me. You'll also get access to a 2,500 deep dive Word um, article on Firecracker from my sponsor's email a couple of weeks ago. OK, so the mighty container. Docker is really what um, set the scene for us. And I remember first using it. I was probably a bit late to the party around 2015. And I was probably as excited about that as I have been about anything. And it was because you could build code once and run it anywhere. And at the company I worked at at the time, that was one of the main problems that we had. You know, we'd have to get an engineer to log into production to download a binary for us to bring it down, decompile it, and compare it to our source code. Because we were never really sure if there was a bug, whether our fixes had made it to production or not. And a lot of companies bought into this. Gartner said the container image is effectively um, the, the standard artifact for distributing software now. The Docker Hub made that super easy because we could then um, release an image for Redis or our software and distribute that to our customers and our users very quickly. Now, the other thing you notice about containers is um, they just boot instantly. Now, it's not strictly booting, um, but they are coming up instantly. They're coming up very, very quickly. One of the things that makes them easy to share is that we have these um, these layers. And the layer may be the operating system laid down, then some libraries, then the app. So if you only change your app and you want to synchronize that image, that's the only thing you have to push up um, and synchronize. Likewise, it is great for isolation um, because it means that we can kind of package things and, and think about them individually and connect them back together over the network, whereas in the past, we were installing many applications on one server, having to manage them together, uh, and one could affect another one, very much so. So um, Richard, if you help me here, Cont Linux containers effectively with Docker look a lot like this, don't they? Um, pretty much, yeah. Yeah, I would agree with that, yeah. So at the beginning, we have the entry point. Now, in the previous slide, we had Redis and an app. And that would effectively launch just that application. And you might say, well, in a VM, I have to have an init process, I have to boot it, I have to have firmware, and, and goodness knows what else. And eventually, my program will start in system D. But here, we launch directly to the process. And that's actually because there's some trickery going on here. A, a container is actually just an isolated process on a Linux machine. Um, there isn't no real thing in the Linux kernel as a container. Um, the file system of a VM, we would have to, let's say, launch, let's say, 10 Redis machines with 10 gigs of disk space. Be 100 gigs we would need on that server. With the copy and write file system, what we can do is download that image once, launch our 10 VMs and only track what's been written to the disk. And therefore, we can effectively 
um, assign many more containers to that than we would have been able to, as long as they don't all use that exact amount of disk space, you know, with writes. The um, virtual Ethernet adapter is really handy so we can address our container. Um, there's, there's no point really running a web server unless we can get to that. The process isolation keeps us apart from other bits of code, allows us to drop into the specific operating system that we've built. And then the limits are applied through what's called a Linux C group. So um, Rich, what do C groups do? So uh, they, they do a lot, but mainly in this context, they uh, limit the, the resources your process has um, access to. So it will limit the, the memory or the CPU that it can use. Yes. Um, and then the network bridge. So this is the, uh, so I guess in this, in this context, this is uh, the, the, where your the, the, the VETH pair or is, is connected to, to then communicate out onto the network of your, of the host machine. So it's, yeah, it's, it's, I guess it's entry point in and out uh, of the network. Yeah. Uh, and so we get effectively what looks and feels a lot like an entire system, um, but we don't have to have any anything really um, like a VM anymore. We get a lot of advantages, but there are some drawbacks here. With a with a virtual machine, there's a different level of security and isolation compared to um, a container. Now you were on a talk with AWS recently, weren't you, Richard? And um, I think it was a project manager from there was explaining their view on what they consider to be appropriate level of isolation. Yeah, so they they, they well, have this workloads. Yeah, yeah. So so they 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 very much don't want to share the host kernel uh, as containers do, um, and they they definitely prefer. And this is how they've gone with with Lambda and Fargate, uh, a completely isolated virtual machine. So the host kernel is is not shared. Um, except for, I guess this, this is where I always say, well, it's not completely isolated because we are running on a host machine as such. Um, but I guess from a, from an operating system point of view, it has its own kernel. And and they, AWS are very strong on that. They they will not use uh, a shared kernel or containers at the host and that, level. And that's really because the the level of isolation for that is is not the same. What yes. I'm trying to show in this picture is that um, if if you were to run a Lambda function in, let's say, an OpenFast function um, with Docker, the host kernel is going to be shared between the two of those, which means if there's some way of you breaking out of your container, um, you're going to end up in the host kernel and you could potentially affect the other ones on there or access the storage of them, confidential data. The idea with the um, the multiple kernels is that, okay, you have that isolation boundary. It's very difficult for you to break out into the hypervisor. Um, but as they explained, traditional hypervisors just don't really cut it when you have got used to um, containers, do they? Because you've got a really slow startup. Um, I think we're talking double digits, if not minutes, for some VMs, particularly if they're, if they're running Windows. We've got a very large images. I mean, the last time one of you on the call built an AMI, how big was it? Probably pretty big. And then because the, the AMI for, for Amazon isn't going to be layered like Docker is, you're having to push that whole thing up every time you run CI and pay for that bandwidth. The containers allow us to, to ship diffs. Um, now, there's also a pretty large surface area one of the differences with Firecracker is that they don't virtualize like a PS2 mouse and a graphics card. They give you just enough to run a process, which is like a virtual disk, a virtual socket, and a, a one key keyboard. Um, I don't know. Do you know what that's for, Richard, for rebooting it? Uh, yeah, I believe that is, is so you can do the essentially the equivalent of a control alt delete uh, yeah. to reboot. So, and that's all you get. Right, because you don't tend to need those things for the kind of applications we use containers for, which is predominantly server-based uh, request response or, or stateful applications. Now, hypervisors are pretty expensive. If you've worked at a company that had a contract with VMware, uh, it's quite eye-watering the amount you have to pay to get these sort of tools. And they're very legacy. 
they do not have um, a REST API, for instance, which is what we kind of think is table stakes these days. Um, Docker has an API, a gRPC API, very easy to use. Container D has one. Yet you start to struggle or you're going into very old technology that's not built for the job. And this is where micro VMs come in. Um, you get back that instant start. You strip back all that attack surface. And also, by the way, like starting a floppy disk drive driver is why a normal VM is slow. So that's been taken out by the team. Um, and now it can be API driven, which is exactly what we want. We want to be able to issue a command to pause the VM, to snapshot it, to bring it back up again. Um, and it mixes really well with container technology, doesn't it, Richard? It does, yeah, yeah. And I think that's 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 the important part of it. I think you've is the, I guess, the fast start time. You know, the instant start that you mentioned, uh, the stripped back support for the devices, um, and and being API driven. Uh, like you said, it's um, it's expected these days. Um, and then, 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 like you said, the added benefit and the bonus of having that UX experience around containers. Um, so I don't necessarily have to copy raw file systems around and do all this this craziness, which is to be honest, quite 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 painful. So we all love containers. And there's anybody here who who's kind of anti-containers? You might be anti-Kubernetes, but if you're pro-Kubernetes or pro-containers, the micro VM can be orchestrated in a way where it feels the same. But going back to that diagram, you then get that isolation. Now, that can be important for several reasons. One is sometimes it's extremely hard to run something through Docker that shouldn't be run through Docker. For instance, Docker. If you're running a CI build on GitHub Actions, you can actually um, install the Docker package and run Docker build and not worry about whether it's root or whether you're having to um, bind something into it or, or run in a certain namespace or do funny kernel things just works. You can run a kind cluster, install K3S. Um, but when you do a build through Docker in Docker on GitLab on Kubernetes, you're so far removed. You have to do so many weird hacky things that it becomes quite a horrible, uh, unsafe, insecure, slow, uh, goodness knows what else, obtrusive practice. And so this is at least one area where they could potentially be useful. And another one is um, where you would use legacy VMs um, previously. So we will actually look at a couple of use cases. And we're also going to um, look at alternatives. But first of all, we've got, a, got a, a plenty for you today. I want to get us right in to uh, my lab. And this is something that you can run on your own machine. Um, if you're one of my GitHub sponsors, you would have heard about this or you'll hear about it tomorrow in the email. And what we need is uh, a bare metal Linux host or a VM that supports nested virtualization. So DigitalOcean, GCP support this. Uh, you need Docker installed. And that's that's basically it. And you can run this lab. It also has a init process. We're going to cover what these do later, written in Go. So you can poke around with that. The Docker file will build the init process, layer it into just the normal Alpine container. And then we're actually going to boot this up. And if we wanted to add some of the packages in here, we could um, just pop them in, like put curl in there. Let's actually, let's actually do this. We'll put curl in. Um, and then let's see if we, yeah, let's just do curl. That's the readme then. The the boot script, the scripts to start the VM up. Let's take a quick look at that. Now, I so said this is API driven. So the first thing you do with Firecracker is you tell it uh, where the kernel is to boot. So you do need a kernel. And you can pass it in some additional configuration um, that's convenient, such as an IP address. We can then add a network adapter. And this isn't in the official quick start. So by using this example I've put together, you can have a lot more fun with it um, than that one. We then add a drive, and it's possible to add multiple drives, and the drives effectively files on your host. So we put all the stuff we need from a container into a file, share the file into um, the Firecracker VM, and it will mount it as a drive. 
Now, I could also just share my SSD by telling it the location of dev NVMe, you know, disk one, partition zero, whatever, in a very similar way. And then finally, you start the instance. Now, stopping it is the same API call with a stop. We can also suspend this, can take it completely out of memory and CPU, and then even move that file to another host and start it up again. And to resume a snapshot is about five milliseconds, I'm told. So for particularly for serverless, this could be very interesting for scale to zero. Even if you don't need the isolation, the, the savings that you could potentially get from this in terms of packing in more functions could be interesting. Okay, uh, we also set up networking. Now, Richard, are you using um, TAPS with what you're doing? What, what kind of networking are you using? Uh, so we are actually using a, um, a feature branch of Firecracker that adds support for Mac VTAP. Um, okay. So, so which is slightly different from from the TAP model that is being traditionally supported by um, Firecracker. Okay. But effectively, does it bridge that micro VM to an, another network? It does, yeah. So, so they, they, like Mac VTAP, uh, the difference is you don't have to have uh, the separate tap on the ton and connect those two. Okay. Um, you, you just create the device, uh, give it a MAC address, and then that device is actually directly attached to the, the micro VM. So this might look quite alien to people that haven't been running these kinds of commands before. Um, they are all normal Linux commands. What we're doing is adding what we call a, a tap device. This works as a, a layer two L2 device, um, which is effectively on the network. Once that's installed on our host, we then give it an IP address in a in a private range. This is one that I've picked. Bring it up, and then we can start the micro VM and attach it to it. At which point, if we enable IP forwarding and masquerading, we can basically have our machine act as a router, and the micro VM will push its traffic through there, and we'll get to Google and we can install APK packages and download Docker and everything else. So those are the main parts. The other bit that you need to know about is, and this will become clearer as we go through everything today, the later parts, is that we will download a container. Um, well, we're actually building a container first on the disk, but we could download one from the Docker Hub. So building one, and then extracting it into a tar and all container images effectively a number of tars. And what we're going to do is blow them out into just one folder. Then we create a, uh, a disk file with f allocate, format it as x4 so we can boot off it, mount it, and we're going to untar the container image into it, unmount that, and then start up. So there's a lot, to, lot going on. But the make file um, does help a lot here. I was to go into the Firecracker lab. Bigger for everybody. Okay. And the first thing I want to do is make uh, all. And what we can see, it's very, very quick is I've got a container image at the top. We've done our Docker build where we've built my Golang init process. We've then copied it into uh, an Alpine container. Um, we didn't do anything extra in the Alpine container. We've not saved anything into that. No more, no more packages. We extract the root file system, create a disk image, but then mount it, put the files in there. And so now we have, if we have a look at DF, the disk usage, in a human format, the image, 75 megs, and the tar, the tar was seven megs. Next, we're going to go and split the screen. And I want to do make this bit a bit bigger, make, make boot in there. This is going to send the firecracker commands. And the bit that I, I struggled with originally is that you sort of set up a process don't you Richard and then you send commands to it yes that's right yeah yeah so depending on how you start it so you you know the default way is 
you start Firecracker and then it's a one-to-one -one relationship between Firecracker and a micro VM. So for every micro VM you want to create, there will be a separate Firecracker process. And yeah, it does by default uh, start the API server. And you can see your socket you put there. You can start it in a mode where you don't start the API server and you supply all of the configuration um, on the command line. Um, in a JSON and, file. In a JSON file, yeah. Um, and there are there are benefits, I guess, well, there's pros and cons to, to why you'd want to go each route. Um, yeah. There, there are time savings if you go via the pure config route. Um, Let's see what the time's like for this then. So we've got we've got that process. I'm gonna hit enter. And um, taking a little bit longer. Now, this might be because of the networking. I think I've already got Firecracker running. I had this earlier. Another go. There you go. So how quick was that? And to exit these, you just type reboot, and they're gone. Let's try that again. We'll see if we can. We'll see if we can time it. I don't know if we'll be able to time it. It was that quick. Wow. I mean, I can't even run a Docker container that quickly and get into a shell. Um, super fast. I've got networking, and what's better than just having networking is that it it works as well. So if we go to our make file, I've got some commands in there that we can run. This is Alex Ellis, Firecracker Init Lab. Who thought that was quick? Must be somebody that's alive on the live stream. So to the instructions then. So let's type in free until we get 120, basically 128 megs of RAM or 112 showing. Let's look at the CPU info. And might be able to pipe that to less. So it's an AMD Epic because that's what's on my machine. Um, and then we can look at the IP addresses. We've got the if zero that we set up, and this IP address was configured in script. And then the route will show that it's going through the host. Um, and this IP address is what's on my host. If I look on my side, do a grep, you should see that's my tap adapter. Now, to make it more interesting, let's see if we can ping. Um, anything so we can ping cloudflare and let's put a name server in place because the container doesn't come with one of these and then let's try and ping google worked okay can we add curl I think we can, but if we need the CA certs for that. But effectively, we've got our internet access. Micro, micro VM is working. Just looking at what questions we've got. Um, somebody's asking, can you get metrics out of Firecracker? Well, yeah, you can. Um, I got some quite interesting metrics out of Firecracker and was talking to Richard about this. Let's see if we can get up a Grafana cloud. The metrics are available cover all kinds of things, um, CPU, memory, IO. So if you are thinking of building a system where you've got some form of chargeback, like Amazon do with Lambda, that could be particularly useful. Yeah, I see Richard, you're fielding a whole bunch of questions as well. And maybe we'll pull that up later. So first our micro VM, um, if you kill the process for Firecracker, it goes away. Um, which is unlike Docker, because we know Docker and the daemon in the background and everything's kind of attached to that. These are bound to the process. So if you want to go and try at that lab, um, there is a link to that on my Twitter account. Okay. So we'll go back a bit back, a bit back into the theory now. So with us, Richard. I am, yep. 
Yeah, I was just I was curious about the yeah. the boot time because um, AWS me. always. Oh. Hear me. What have I done? Bear with us for a moment. I don't know why I can't hear you. So you've been talking all this time. Sorry about that. No, no, I only just started then. You would have a Linux desktop. I can fix this this way. Hey, something now? Hello. Mm. This is bizarre. I can't hear anything. Richard, you on mute? Yeah, I just muted myself. I was going to test right. my audio on my side. Well, sorry for this. We will get this working again. You can hear both. We just can't hear anything ourselves. <laughs> oh, oh, Richard, can you? You can hear me. Can you? You're mute again. You yeah, I can, yeah, I can hear you. All right. Yeah, all good. I'm going to reload my browser. Give me a second. That's good. You can hear us both. Um, I'll go back through some of the. So actually, with the the boot time. Um, so I put in the the comments. There is an argument called boot timer. Um, so we've never actually used that in in our implementation. But um, you know that could be useful. And actually, uh, when we, when you talk to the Firecracker team at Amazon, that they 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 have a number of timings that they publish. Um, so they reckon boot to Linux user space is in about 125 milliseconds. So pretty okay. quick. I think we're back. Hey. Apologies for um, using Linux on the desktop, but it means that I can run Firecracker, and we should really bl blame Richard for this anyway. <laughs> Do you want to tell them why? Uh, <laughs> why I yeah, bought so a new computer? Yeah, so when we, we first started chatting about Firecracker, um, we were we were getting into building kernels, and um, I was just saying, no, I, don't, I don't use a desktop. Uh, sorry, I don't use a laptop because it takes too long to to compile the kernel. And then I said, oh, I've got this uh, ThinkStation uh, with um, uh, Threadripper Pro, and it just compiles it within like you know 30, 40 seconds. Um, so I think that set off a whole chain of purchasing, didn't it? It did. Um, and it's really much, much faster. I mean, there's a tweet people will find, and it went down from about, I think it was three minutes 50 on an Intel NUC with, with eight cores to something ridiculous like 38 seconds. So that was brilliant. Um, okay, so the last thing that we talked about was metrics. Yes, you can export them, you can then put them into a Prometheus format. Um, yeah, live is real. Hi, Christian. Now, let's get back into the theory again. And um, we were talking about these micro VMs that actually look a lot like containers and have a lot of the benefits. If we decide to tap into them, it's not that you're necessary, but it's, I think it's better if you do. Now, Gvisor is called an application kernel for containers. So AWS said their boundary for multi-tenancy would be individual kernels. Uh, Google have a different opinion on this, or maybe they don't, but they have this solution of an application kernel. This is where we'll actually run um, a kernel in software in user space, and they have this run SC binary that does that. And that will effectively sandbox all of the kernel calls, and it is so amazingly clever that they've even built their own TCP IP stack, a complete networking stack, just like you would find in the Linux. It's crazy. Hmm. Um, now, that is another option. And there is an open fast customer that I'm in touch with. They wanted to isolate their containers because they provide open fast functions per customer. What did they do? 
they went into GKE, they clicked a button that said, please give me a node pool with GVisor, and that was it. And then immediately they had a kind of separation that felt a lot like a micro VM just by clicking a button. And this is eventually where I think we'll see this firecracker type technology get to where AWS will just give you a button and you say, use firecracker instead. Um, or perhaps Weaveworks will give you that or someone else. And with all of this technology, it's going to start very low down and then eventually be more democratized. As we saw with Docker, it's been a long journey. Now it's just generally accepted. Okay. Now, obviously, yes, Fire, the, the performance of GVisor is going to be slower because it's got to go through uh, a kernel written in user land, then to a kernel on the host. However, it is an option and it works. So, you know, evaluate it. So why is it so good to use Firecracker uh, when there's already stuff on Linux like QMU? Richard? Because QMU is too slow, is it? Yeah, so I guess when we when we started out on this, uh, QMU didn't have a the equivalent of a uh, a micro VM. Uh, so uh, you know the minimal footprint, minimal resource usage, minimal device model. Um, it's more generalized uh, virtualization. Um, that has since changed. You know there are uh, you know a micro VM uh, portion to it now, but at the time there wasn't. Um, yeah. And and. Firecracker is dedicated to one task that so we, we, we found uh, useful to us. So okay, that... Yeah, I have a similar experience, really, because the init process I showed you earlier, written in Go, I originally launched that with QMU instead. Um, it wasn't slow, but it does assume you want to monitor and a serial console and all the rest of it. Um, and Intel started working something called not QMU, or NEMU, it's now deprecated and they're building something called cloud hypervisor instead which is based on cross vm now cross vm is what firecracker is based upon and so we're starting to see people converging around technologies here but if everything listed here is eventually going to the kernel's virtual machine management um, that, that is available in linux red hat have a another project called libk run i was introduced to this by um, sergio who showed me how to run FASD with libk run. At that point, every FASD open FAS function that was run on a host was completely isolated in its own kernel. So that was really interesting. Um, and that, so they are doing work around here too. And then when it comes to Kubernetes, I know a lot of you, like um, Carlos and others, you're interested in how this relates to Kubernetes. Um, Kata Containers is a joint program with Intel and other vendors. And that integrates um, probably all of it. I'd say probably all of these K KVM-based emulation options into Kubernetes. The Firecracker version, I know of some people using it. When I tried it, it was just far too early and it was extremely slow. I mean, the cold start was about 10 seconds, if not more, for a cached image because um, there's a lot going on. Um, and so that is why it may not actually just be the right thing to drop into Kubernetes for a pod. Richard's going to cover that. Um, GVisor, we talked about, that works really well in Kubernetes. There might be a performance penalty for it. And then we have an option in the open source community for running a VM as a VM. So not as a Kubernetes pod or something bespoke, but literally I want a Windows 10 VM. Kubevert can give us a custom resource and then use QM, QMU or KVM to find a machine and run it on there. So why are we excited about Firecracker? Well, I think we've covered a lot of this already. Um, it's very, very fast. We showed you the demo, and I, I couldn't even time it. And that was adding a network. If I didn't have a network, it would be practically instant. Um, Richard, you made a good point that you can launch thousands of these very quickly can't you without killing the machine uh yep yeah, yeah and uh yeah that's what that's, that's a big tenant of of the original design of this so because they want to run thousands of lambda uh, firecracker instances on on a single machine yeah so that is important and that gives us the the container feel and then snapshot and instant restore so if i if i snapshot this this vm that you saw in the background kill it off 
I can then just pop it back into any firecracker process by taking the snapshot file. And it's about five to 10 milliseconds to restore um, from testing. We can integrate with CNI, which is starting to take, again, stuff from the container world and benefit from it. Um, we can have a complete route. We can even run nested virtualization in Firecracker if we really so wanted to. Um, but as I said, for things like CI, running a container with Docker inside of it on a Kubernetes cluster and then trying to run Docker again, it's just it just doesn't work very well. Um, so this is why we're excited about it, as you can probably tell. And it's also fun to use because of that API. Now, it is used for real work. This came out of AWS because they had a solution where they had warm pools of EC2 instances. They would allocate it to a customer and then take it back and reuse it again after running some cleansing scripts on it. But they were often over-provisioned. Uh, there were other issues at play. And now this is rolled out in at least some regions for both of those services. Fly is from a chap called Kurt in the US, a VC-backed company, and they want to be a CDN for containers. I think I saw a couple of people here that are, are Fly users. Coeb is a completely closed source platform um, from Scaleway or the X Scaleway team. It does something very similar to Fly, but for functions. AppFleet, again, is similar to Fly. You may be seeing a pattern here. The kinds of use cases of Lambda and Fargate are actually quite attractive to other people as well. But then when Weaveworks comes in, tell us how you've kind of taken a different angle here. What, what do you do with it? So uh, I guess our first foray into to Firecracker was with something called Ignite. Uh, and Ignite was really designed to replicate the Docker CLI experience. But instead of running containers, it would run your container uh, as a micro VM in, in Firecracker. Um, but it was very much a, a CLI focused tool, um, which is great. Um, you know, we, we did this early on uh, in, 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 I guess, in the life of, of uh, Firecracker. But more recently, we, we, we're building a solution that is sort of the successor or, 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 the, or the son of um, Ignite and something we also had, which was called Firecube. Uh, Firecube was a layer that sort of um, bootstrapped a Kubernetes cluster via Ignite in MicroVM. So Liquid Metal was just the evolution of that. Um, and it, it is focused purely on, I guess, being API driven. Um, whether that's from the Kubernetes side or just purely from the micro VM side, it's all API driven. There, there isn't really a CLI portion of it. Um, yes, but you know, we, you know, WeWorks we care mainly about Kubernetes. Yep, Kubernetes. Um, we kind of touched on Kata containers. That isn't strictly just for Firecracker. It does aim to support a number of different virtualizers. Um, and then actuated is something I've been working on recently uh, to give you isolated, uh, immutable, self-hosted CI runners, basically uh, a completely fresh VM for every run of a CI job where you can install K3S, Kind, Docker, do whatever you want in there. It's completely isolated and torn down at the end. Um, so if you're interested in um, solving some of the pain around CI, get in touch with me afterwards. So I put this diagram together because I wanted everybody to, to learn something that either they, they didn't know or maybe a good refresher. So with Firecracker, and when we start to look at VMs, well, Firecracker skips the whole um, boot process, doesn't it, that we'd normally have where you've got something like um, Grub um, or the equivalent that runs first. And then Grub's job is generally to load this initial RAM file system that contains our, our kernel and the initial code to run. So with Firecracker, we start with VM Linux, not a VM Linux. So the Z is a compressed kernel. And if you've got a, a, a compressed kernel, you can decompress it with a kernel utility and you can just use it with Firecracker. As I said earlier, me and Richard, we've been building our own. We upgraded our machines because we wanted to go faster. Because if you're iterating a lot, it can take a long time. But once you're there, um, your kernel config file, you can put that in source control, keep it, reuse it. You may need some additional drivers and modules 
these tend to be loaded in that initial phase. Um, and then the kernel's job is to mount this init RAM file system. That will start off something um, which will begin your init system. And this might be like system D. Once system D is running, it will then start things like open SSH, Nginx, set up networking. And you know these boxes aren't gospel. You may be mounting file systems in all three of those larger layers. But the idea is this is what's going on. This is the anatomy. Anything you want to add, Richard? Uh, I was just thinking, probably just add that this is a really important um, aspect in that fast boot time where it doesn't have the bootloader and it boots directly into the kernel at the, uh, there's this a special address, isn't there? And then it starts executing straight away. Yeah. And now we don't have, uh, I mean, it doesn't have support for Windows or Mac OS. QMU does, and it uses very similar um, things to here. Somebody's asking, what if you've got a, a GPU? My understanding from my experience is that you can mount any block device from the host. So I've mounted a block device. You could mount the GPU as long as it's showing up on, on dev or somewhere around there. Hopefully that answers your question, Walid. Now the init system isn't strictly necessary. Um, you you can potentially make what you want to start up your like Nginx, the init process. But it's generally not a good idea if it's a long running system because init systems do interesting things like restart stuff. Um, so they have an important job to play. Now, if you look at Docker for Mac and you sort of rip off its, its mask, it is a VM on your Mac running Linux um, or on your Windows machine or on Linux, it is just the host. This might be surprising. I'm sure a lot of people know this, but there are no containers effectively for Mac. Windows has some constructs, but again, uh, until probably very recently, you were always running a Linux VM because we're talking about features that are specific to Linux. So a container is Linux. When we strip back, we've got Linux. And that's, so that's the first thing we need for Firecracker because it uses the same tech. Um, we need a host with a modern kernel, a bare metal machine, or a cloud that supports nested virtualization. So you can get nested virtualization on GCP and DigitalOcean. Um, with bare metal, Equinix Metal can look expensive to begin with if you're thinking you're paying, I don't know, half a dollar an hour but there are plans where you can prepay, same on Amazon. Um, there are smaller instances on Amazon than on the bigger clouds. Scaleway has small bare metal. Oracle Cloud has some ARM bare metal that I think is effectively free. Um, Linode has options here as well. So this could be a problem for you if you don't have bare metal or access to nested vert. That is a, a prerequisite. So I run a Linux host on my desktop because I do a lot of container development. Richard does as well. That's an example of where you could run this kind of thing. Otherwise, you need to be able to run a virtual machine in a virtual machine or buy a Raspberry Pi. That works as well. So I have a blog post on how I built a, a Linux desktop. This was in 2019 because I just had uh, a feeling that Linux was a lot more suitable for container development or running Docker builds. Because on your Mac, you've got to run a VM to get Linux to do everything you want to do. So why not just have Linux anyway? And as I say, the, a four gig Raspberry Pi is plenty enough to run micro VMs. So you can go and watch that uh, video, read the blog post, make your own if you need to. Okay, so Richard, let's go over this, shall we? Do you want to run us through prereqs and how we can interface with it? Uh, yeah, so I, I guess the first thing is, um, so you'll need an uncompressed kernel. Uh, so actually within the Firecracker repo, uh, they actually publish uh, some config files uh, with the various uh, modules turned on that are required. Um, so that's always a good starting point. Um, I saw that in the in the lab so that if you go to the lab you'll see it's actually downloading it from the amazon um repository yeah 
and then actually within there as well there is, there is instructions to build your your root file system as well which you also showed in the lab um, what we do with the, the container images is actually using the feature of, of container d and exposing those container images as um, uh, block devices for firecracker to consume but um, you know choose one of those two options is probably the best thing um, so, so let's say that again because i know carlos asked this question option one is what i did in the lab which is yes. we create a disk image as a file we then mount that do what we need to do to it unmount it and pass that as a as a block device to the file was a reference yep. to the file a path or second option is second option is is you use a container uh, so you build a container so we we use just the the published uh, ubuntu containers as, as our base uh, we add various things into that um, then we use a feature of um, container D, uh, specifically the snapshotters. Yeah. So we use the device, uh, well, dev mapper or device yeah. mapper uh, snapshotter. So you can then e expose a container via a block device. Um, and a block and device, for anybody that's um, finding this quite technical, like it is like dev slash something or other that's what we mean when we're talking about that like your dev sda your, your dev mvme so it actually appears on the system in that way and then it, the path can be given to firecracker yeah that's correct yeah and, and it has this uh if you use container d um you know there's two ways you can do that um but actually in like a production system you don't necessarily always want to pre-allocate all of that space for every yes. micro vm so it, it uses something called thin pools so the micro vm thinks it's got 10 gigs but actually on disk it's only taking up two gigs so you it's can a bit like we talked about earlier isn't it the the copy and write the cow file systems like overlay fs very similar exactly. idea yeah, exactly like that. And it, underneath it has the same principles where it has, has the layers of the snapshots um, and yeah. you have the copy on right as, as the block device. So we have some time left. We still got time um, and we've got more to show you, but want to give you a quick idea. How do you, so we ran a, we ran a firecracker VM. I showed you how to get a kernel. I showed you how to get a root file system how to enable networking, but then how else can we interact with that? So I did curl commands to it, but what? how else can we interface? Uh, to to the actual micro VMs? Yeah. So so there, there is another option. Um, so you can communicate over uh, VSOC. Um, so my, uh, Firecracker supports VSOC. Um, so that allows you to open a communication channel uh, from, from the host to the guest and communicate via, via a socket, essentially. Um, so you could, for instance, um, create an agent that is put into the um, to the guests OSs, and then you could communicate backwards and forwards via that. And, and some people do that to to, to get at metrics of the guest or perform operations on them. Yes, uh, you could use SSH, I suppose, as well. But in terms yeah. of actually talking to Firecracker's API rather than necessarily the, the micro VM, um, there's a, there's a SDK in Go. And um, it's quite trivial to launch it. And when you look at the structs, they're very, very similar to the, the API anyway. You're telling it where the disks are. You're telling it how many CPUs it's got, how much RAM. Um, you can then compile that in a multi-arch binary. And as you'll see, I can run this on my Raspberry Pi or on a big server. The JSON approach is, is what you're using in Liquid Metal, isn't it? It is, yeah. And then we also have a HTTP, HTTP API we talked about. There's a tool called Fire CTL, which is by the official team. And that's just a shortcut for effectively pointing at an image in kernel and, and booting them. And then Firecracker Container D is an interesting project. Um, it has a lot of things going on, but the idea is that it will start a micro VM with run C inside of it load in a container image and then run C will execute in there. So it's like a container in a micro VM managed by container D, which manages containers. So it's a lot going on, um, but it's very clever. And if you use Kata containers or you're looking at Kubernetes and Firecracker, that's probably what you'll end up being um, running through. 
Yeah, that's so an you interesting don't one. use that, do you? you? You go directly to Firecracker at the moment. Yeah, and, then, yeah. and this is actually came up in the discussions I think earlier on. It's um, that really, especially if you use it with Kubernetes, that results in a pod per uh, Firecracker micro VM, whereas we're we're running a bunch of pods within a single Firecracker VM. So it's related, but a slightly different approach. Someone's asking me, where does container containers like container OSs like Talos Bottle Rocket overlap? Well, this Firecracker runs a VM for us. What you put in that is up to you. That's the answer, really. So you can put Ubuntu, CentOS, you know, any kind of Linux operating system that's supported by the CPU architecture. Specific operating systems for a container like Alpine, for instance, is purpose built for a very small environment. You could load that into a micro VM if, if you needed to. Now, let's go to uh, the options for virtualization because both of us have, have written projects with Firecracker. We're taking different, effectively different routes. Um, the CAT containers says uh, the Kubernetes control plane and the node are basically fair game running as per normal. But the pod, each individual pod is going to be a boundary and strongly isolated. Liquid Metal over at Weaveworks, you're saying uh, Kubernetes control plane is potentially out in the wild, maybe EKS or something. And then the node is going to be virtualized. And then by way of virtualizing the entire node, all the pods are also virtualized. That'd be correct. Yeah, that, that's correct. Yeah, and that was a very conscious choice by us for the solution we were building. Why is that? So, so we we were building a solution for for Edge. So you might you know we were you might only have five physical machines, um, but the customer that we're dealing with wanted to run multiple Kubernetes clusters with the, on that hardware. So they they basically wanted to run every node, including the control plane nodes here. Uh, in micro VMs, just so that mm. they can squeeze as many uh, clusters in on that 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 bit of tin. Interesting, very interesting. So, this is the the two main kind of options you have with Kubernetes: is you're going to isolate pods, like Gvisor does, and have a runtime class for that and a node pool, or you're going to isolate uh, the entire node and and by virtue of that, everything that's on it. So, do you want to show us what that looks like? If I put you up on the screen. Yep, sure. I can share my screen. Who's been tweeting? I've got to, I want to give these t-shirts away. I'll be looking for the best two tweets. I'll get it shipped out to you this weekend. At Alex Alice UK. Cool. So I've got one slide just to set the context, um, but okay. then then we'll go into the the actual demo. Um, so so in this demo, there's two locations. There's there's my my desktop on the left hand side, and then we have some hosts running in Equidex Metal. So the idea is so we, we have a host in Equinix Metal. Uh, that's the actual IP address of the host that, that I'm using. Um, and I've installed three things on there. So this thing called Flintlock is that's something that we built. So anything can Orange is Weaveworks stuff that they've built, which will be open source uh, if it's not already. Uh, and then we have two, uh, I guess, two um, prerequisites, Container D and Firecracker. Um, so they are installed on every single bare metal machine. And I've got two of those in this demo. So they basically sit there doing nothing uh, until Flintlock is called. So Flintlock is basically an API server. You call it and say, create me a micro VM, and then it does uh, all of the interaction with Container D and Firecracker to make that micro VM a reality. Um, but it sits there doing nothing at this moment in time. We want to create Kubernetes clusters. So um, we decided very early on that we were going to use Cluster API for this. So Cluster API requires a, a management cluster. Uh, and a management cluster is just a Kubernetes cluster with the Cluster API controllers uh, installed on it. So. Um, if we wanted to create, and this is what we're going to do, if we wanted to create a Kubernetes cluster made up of micro VMs, uh, first thing we do is, is specify uh, the shape of our cluster uh, via YAML. Um, so that, that's representation of it. 
Um, that is actually understood by a cluster API provider that we've, we've built called MicroVM uh, or CapMVM. So it basically reconciles that, that declaration and it's going to it's going to have some interaction with the you know core capi or um, for instance the cube adm bootstrapper so that we know how to bootstrap a kubernetes cluster on top of these these micro vms so it it does all of this interaction and then the provider then starts making individual calls to to flintlock to say create me a micro vm and this is where flintlock then starts to talk to container d to pull down the images for to be used by the volumes and the kernel um, it also uses the the content store to store the specification as well um, so then as we mentioned earlier we're going to get some block devices so that basically means then we can start an instance of firecracker uh, which creates us a micro vm um, and because we're using Capi and we've got uh, the user data that contains how to bootstrap Kubernetes via QADM, uh, that node, that KVM, micro VM, then becomes a whole Kubernetes node. Um, so that is, that's basically the flow. Um, okay. Who, who's using um, Capi? Let us know in the chat. But it's good, very good for this kind of use case because you're effectively. Do you still need a, a, a like a seed cluster where you you create your custom resource and drop it in there, and then the controller goes off and does everything? Yeah. What's so that point, what's the point of that? Why wouldn't you just do Terraform or like um, the the tools that we've seen in the past, like Cube Spray? Why wouldn't you just run that in in a CI job? Well, you could do. I, I, I guess yeah, you you can do. Um, I guess this is a different operational model where everything is declarative. So you yeah. have a management cluster that then uh, manages the life cycle of a of a number of of child clusters. So that really, this is, I guess, catering to the instead of running a small number of large clusters, running a large number of small clusters that could be spread out in different infrastructures. So where, your, where would your customer run that seed cluster then? At the edge or centrally? Uh, so, so for our customer, um, yeah. so they what well, they they have a like a because they're going to end up running like about uh, one thousand five hundred clusters. Um, so they they Not have complex. yeah. So they they have regions that then manage a set of edge locations. So the okay. the, the management cluster will run at the region level. It, on premise or in in a cloud? On premise. Okay. On premise. That's yeah. that's really cool. Okay, and will that be running in Firecracker as well? Uh, undecided at the moment is it's using uh vSphere, uh, because they're in the regions, yes. um, and but it is still using Capi, so it uses Cap V, so the the vSphere yeah. provider. Okay. for well, let's yeah. see this demo then. And I'm sh I, I saw you had a, a plushy toy arrive, didn't you, with the turtles all the way down? I did, yeah, it sat on the uh, my, my shelf just there. We're have to, gonna have to see that before the end of the show, <laughs> yeah. yeah, it cost me a lot of shipping, um. <laughs> So uh, in this demo, I've got uh, four panes, essentially. Um, uh, this one, our top left-hand side, is just some notes. Um, I can share these slides afterwards. Uh, the two... Go for it, Alex. Thanks. Cool. Uh, the two panes on the right uh, are those Equinix hosts. Uh, I've just logged into those to see what... Because uh, um, I'll be running some, some monitoring stuff in there. And the bottom left-hand one is essentially where I'm going to be running commands from my desktop to to um, create the clusters. So so uh, on those hosts, I have container D uh, and Firecracker. So if I wanted to, just to prove that, I can um, just show you that, that the Flintlock is on there, uh, ready to run. So that's our API server. Uh, and this is all open source as well, so you, you can just download this and, and run it yourself. Um, we also have Container D on there um, and Firecracker. We've installed yeah. our version of Firecracker with Mac VTAP, but that doesn't really matter. Yeah. Um, in Equinix, there is some network magic going on. So we've got a, a private VLAN, we've got a NAT gateway, et cetera. But you know, the, there's, these hosts are private. Um, and the reason yeah. I can connect from my machine to to the uh to to them is uh, i've got a vpn open um essentially Ooh, all right yeah um makes sense so let's get started so the bottom left hand side i've already created the kind cluster which is acting as my management cluster um so i can just look at the pods 
I haven't got anything running there except for just a plain kind cluster. Oh, sorry. Uh, quit. So I'm going to have to do some cluster API stuff here, which is okay. essentially what I'm just going to, yeah, just tell it what version of the provider I want to do. Because this is a development provider, I have to provide a, a small local config. Um, so we're going to do that. All right. So if you if you're new to Cluster API, that there is a CLI called Cluster Cuttle um, that you use to interact and you know, install providers into your management cluster. So that's basically what we're doing here. Um, so that's what this is. So let's move on. Cool. So what I'm going to also do in the, in the Equinix hosts, I am going to start a watch just to so you can see the micro VMs starting up. Um, it's not overly interesting, uh, but it we it, it shows a state directory, so you'll see when the micro VMs at least come up on those uh, physical machines. So we we also use an experimental feature of Cluster API called Cluster Resource Sets. This just allows us to install a CNI as soon as the the, cl the cluster is created. Um, so now what I'm going to do is use Cluster Cuttle to to install our uh, micro VM provider and the rest of Core Capi. So this usually takes about 10, 20 seconds. Uh, funnily enough, like Cert Manager always, it takes the, the most amount of time. But essentially, this is just installing some controllers. Oh, I think I didn't hear that. What's it that you, what is it that you have in the top left for viewing the slides? I'm just quite interested in that as well. Uh, so this is this is a project called uh, Look at Me. Um, so one of the engineers in the team that I work in um, actually it basically allows you to create a slideshow from Markdown nice. and present it via the terminal. Going to have um, a look at that later. Definitely, it looks great for this. Yeah, it's really cool. Um, so I'm just going to show um, the the management cluster again. So let's just move that up a bit. So, you so where see are the, we in the whole process? When when so, are we going to see the speed of Firecracker? Ah, uh -huh. right. Let's let's get there then. Um, cool. So so basically, I want to create a cluster that has one control plane machine. Yep. Uh, I'm going to have five work machines. So this is going to be in six micro VMs essentially. And this is all uh, Linux metal. But the kind, where's the kind cluster on your on your machine? Yeah, on my machine. Yeah, okay. um, we're connecting over the. There is some we use cube vip for load balancing but that's that's probably another yes, topic yeah on the other uh, side yeah yeah uh, so we use cluster cuttle to generate the the yaml that defines our cluster yep. so let's just carry on with that um i do need to make one change to that otherwise okay, it won't start so you can see this is the yaml it's you know, it's fairly long uh, as anything with uh, cluster api is but the important point that i need to change is we have this static placement. So this is basically telling uh, Cappy, you know, which of those Equinix machines I need to use. Yep. Um, sorry, two seconds. Feel free to drop in more questions. Do tweet us. We've had some tweets, but I think we can do, we could probably do even better with these. Cool. Um, a thing to note is we're just using, you can see the images we're using for the root file system uh, and the spec of the machine. So two vCPU yep. and two gigs of memory, but I've made those changes. Um, so literally then you apply that definition to the management cluster. So what we should then see is the micro VM on the right hand side oh, is starting to build up. Yep. Control plane. Yeah, control plane is coming up. So the control plane is always the slowest and then the working machines will, will start up because uh, yep. it's bootstrapping the cluster. So what we can also do is get the cube config from the management cluster to connect nice. to this new cluster. So yeah, I'm going to do that. I'm going to get that. And then we'll just watch on the nodes coming up as they come okay. up. So this one is always the slowest. Uh, and this is not a firecracker thing. So we, we are using cloud in it and yeah. cube ADM. To field um, a question for Carlos, because I actually went and did this for the next demo. Um, what kernel customizations did you have to do? Well, basically, um, what I think collectively we've done is taken what Firecracker provided, uh, tried to run Kubernetes, 
and one by one fixed all the errors. And this will be familiar if you've ever run Kubernetes on a Raspberry Pi or Docker on the Pi five years ago when there wasn't even a version of Go that worked on ARM. Um, and so it's just a it's just a case of manually going through one by one by one and then adding in VXLAN. And fortunately, there is a command that K3S ships called K3S check config, and it tells you what you need to put back in. So it's basically the kind of thing you need to do, Carlos, if you want to try. Yeah, and I guess, I guess for us, we also um, are very similar. Um, when yeah. when kubeadm starts, it goes, oh, you, you don't have this kernel module, you don't have that. So we, we added those in on top of what was supplied by the Firecracker team. Um, so you'll see now that the you know, the, the, the five worker node cluster is, is, is already up. Um, Excellent. Um, and what you can see is, um, so if I just start, so this is, uh, Top, top left hand side is on my it's a management cluster. So, so if I look at uh, machine deployment, so you can see the five replicas there. So if I just did a quick edit on that um, and change that to, I don't know, let's just do 10 for the time being. Um, so what you should see is bottom left hand side, the nodes will come up right hand side they will be the firecracker instances um and you'll see that that is just fairly quick actually and this is this isn't a lightweight kubernetes either this is pure upstream kubeadm bootstrap so um so you can see on the right hand side they're already the, fire, the, the vms are already coming up so they are doing Brilliant. the kubeadm join yep. and then what you'll see hopefully in the next 10 15 seconds is those nodes actually joining the Kubernetes cluster and then becoming ready. Brilliant. So you've got all five now? Well, uh, so the five five original ones and these five additional ones that we just, just added uh, are... So we're going to have prob- 10. Yeah, probably waiting on Cilium. Uh, I mean, we to- probably, if you look at the age there, we're, we're talking about less than two minutes for most of them to get ready. So that, compared to launching on EKS or, or Azure, is pretty fast. Yeah, and there's no optimizations from from a guest either uh, yeah. point of view here, or or, or the no. um, yeah, so but perhaps it doesn't need to be. I mean, you're not launching a, a lambda function here. You're you're launching a long lived Kubernetes node. Yeah. Um. So, I hope we're getting some good tweets. I'm good. I want to drop in and show you something I've been doing now. So thank you very much for that, Richard. That was a, that was a really good demo. I thought it was a really good demo, and. I'm going to show you Terminal. So I am also on Equinix Metal here because bare metal, it just happens to be pretty quick from those guys. So if we take a look at my memory, I got 62 gigs of RAM, uh, my procs, 48 procs. Okay, let's start up my controller called actuated and we'll open a htop as well here and the, the problem that i'm looking at is how do you run kubernetes and docker in ci without resorting to docker in docker and um all the problems and security issues around that so i took firecracker and wrote a http server and uh, connected it to github in all the right ways and ended up with um, some GitHub jobs that I was able to run on my own hardware. Now you might ask Alex, why don't you just add one single machine? Um, I would invite you to go and provision a machine, add that as a GitHub runner and see what happens. It's not fun. There's a lot of software you have to install. It's not clearly documented or automated for what you need to add. It's difficult to keep up with that. Um, there's clashes on packages. This, the first time you create a Kubernetes cluster, the next one you create will clash with that. There's a lot of dirty state on there. Um, and so what I'm going to show you is I'm going to launch three, four, five, six, seven different Kubernetes clusters at once, all on these self-hosted machines. And I can give them more RAM and CPU than what we can pay GitHub to get. So over on my actions tab, I've now got all these jobs running and 
here the machines are booting up. I've actually got four scheduled on this host, three scheduled on that one. We see Docker has started, um, SSH is in there, and now the various cores are kind of running these jobs through to completion. Each one of them has got a block device with a special um, container that I've built out, and that has all the tools that you would need for a GitHub Actions runner. Okay, GitHub don't provide one of those yet, so you could take this and customize it. And if we have a look at how we're doing, each one of these is running kind. And off our previous build time, it's about two minutes for the whole lot because it's running in parallel. And we're 41 seconds in. So preparing the nodes. And the point of this job is you've got a custom resource and you want to check that it applies on every Kubernetes version, potentially including new ones that are released, like you know, when, when 124 and 25 and 26 are available. Now, one of the other limitations with GitHub is they uh, give you only 20 jobs across, I think, your account or your organization. If you own this hardware and we're load balancing between the machines, we can have as many as we want. And that goes back to that launch speed of Firecracker just being sort of blisteringly fast. Now, each of these are isolated from each other. They are running an individual Firecracker process. Um, and here we see they're starting to exit and clear up after themselves. They'll never be used again, completely immutable. And then we'll get back to an idle system again. Even more of them are finishing. And we're getting a tick on everything. And they all, they've all run on the, those two Equinix metal machines. If I had 100, it would have distributed between them. But I thought, could I sort of take up the challenge and make this even more uh, interesting? So Firecracker runs on ARM64 because Amazon support ARM servers. So I have a ketchup tester. Now, Ketchup is something that you can't, Kathos, you can't really run this um, as a container. There are projects that em, that sort of muck about like K3D, but you're not really installing K3S on the system and doing a proper test. Um, what this is going to do is check the kernel modules are correct using what I talked about earlier, install Ketchup and wait for, wait for the control plane to start up. And it's going to run on the Raspberry Pi right there next to me or the one downstairs and both of them are connected there it is it's starting now through an inlets tunnel and one of the features of inlets is that any um, http or tcp service you've got allocated to it as the exit server receives requests it will load balance them round robin between anything connected so if i want to do more builds I could put 10 Raspberry Pis and connect them in. I don't really have to manage the operating system or the image that runs on here. The runners are all ephemeral. Um, now, we should be able to poke into this one. And here you can see um, I'm inside. I've got two gigs of RAM. I've got 20 gigs of disk space. And that was something that you didn't um, have before going to have to quit slack um with well you do have two gigs of disk space you have um seven gigs of ram with hosted runners however if i want i can have all of the ram um this is just a parameter really going over to the tests then get up actions drop into it the here's the checking script and we see all of the information about it passing and working so if you do that in my lab, if you download the K3S binary and run this check command, you'll see it fail because you don't have any of those kernel modules. And then we're installing K3S with Ketchup. And we could install OpenFAS if we wanted. And I've got one more demo to show you while that's running that I did this morning. And I was talking to uh, a company um, called Replicated. They do a lot of self-hosted software and management of licenses. They have something where they run their code in end-to-end, -end, takes about an hour, and they open a tunnel 
to a UI testing product. And the UI testing product exercises the, the live version of their code from the CI job, um, runs UI tests, and, and builds a report at the end. So I wanted to show you something similar. Here, what we do is we, um, we pull down Nginx. We run an inlets tunnel to a, an exit server I've already created. And we'll all be able to access it um, for this duration of the sleep. So we'll commit this. And then we'll watch. On that, see, we'll do it we'll put every one second. The tunnel's not ready yet. There's nothing there. But in a short period of time, directly from the Raspberry Pi, no customizations on the operating system, just the, the agent and the image that I've built. We'll connect and run. Start up the tunnel, start up Nginx, and we'll be able to access it from the summit. Now, this would work with other CI technology like GitLab in much the same way or Jenkins. Um, if you have a way to register an agent and ideally a way um, to only run one job on it, then it's pretty much purpose built for this kind of thing. OK, and we're up. So I'm now over the internet accessing that Raspberry Pi completely orchestrated through GitHub. We'll refresh this. We'll get to see the status. Ran Nginx, ran the tunnel, and we're just sleeping for 120 seconds. This allows you to run as root, install Docker, run containers, run kind, just like you would in a, in a GitHub action, potentially allocate more RAM and memory, um, test on ARM devices. We should be able to see that our job from earlier is completed for Kubernetes. Let's take a look. So I think, yeah, it goes into a sleep, that one as well. And we can see Ketchup installing locally, getting merged into the kube context, waiting for core DNS to be ready, looking at the nodes, much like what Richard showed you, um, but for the purpose of CI. So you can do your proper end-to-end -end tests without any Docker in Docker messing about um, having a secure, isolated build. So. Richard, what do you think of this? Yeah, I think it's awesome. Um, I know we've we talked about the, especially the um, the runners side of things. Um, we, we definitely have a use case for using that. Um, so yeah, I think it's great. Um, what I did is I opened this up to a few of you and you've been testing the, the, the PC version of this and we're able to sort of look at how many jobs are being running concurrently per user, um, the duration of different jobs. And if you're interested in this sort of thing, go and have a look at um, actuated samples and samples at ARM64. If you want to try it out, get in touch with me. Um, one of these actually builds a kernel. So you can see what me um, and Richard have actually just been doing all this time. Uh, you install a whole bunch of packages. You then uh, clone the kernel. You check out a specific branch set your config down. This is a firecracker config and then make with the amount of procs available. So if we, if we think about it, I think there's about four CPU procs so we can actually print out how many we're giving and how much RAM at the top, three dash H. And we can do one for the CPUs. this and uh, we can get that started and it should finish by the time we finish the stream and so the the use cases for firecracker then Richard, as we sort of wrap up on this we really what talking about additional isolation but that's not always the 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 point is it uh no i i guess yeah, the additional isolation, I, I guess, if you want to, to spin up an, a completely fresh environment to do something, 
and then tear it down. I guess it's great for that, isn't it? Yep, in ephemeral environments, which is, is very similar to what we use containers for. Yeah. Um, individual things like testing stuff out end to end, because in a container, you can't really have a whole system. With a micro VM, you do have a whole system, so you can test a lot more. You can run as full root. And that's, re that's really what GitHub Actions did as they took that inspiration um, and ran with it. Whereas I think things like Circle CI and Jenkins, where they have container integrations, it's all tightly coupled to Docker. So you can't strictly just run the command Docker build there, uh, whereas, whereas here you can. Um, you're virtualizing whole nodes. We looked at virtualizing um, customer workloads like with Fly, Lambda, Fargate. So be interesting to see what you, the viewers, want to do with this. There is a Firecracker Slack that we're both in, the AWS run, uh, and different end users are around there. There's lots of blog posts now, many more than there were when I first looked at this three, I think it was about three years ago. Um, and there's lots of different examples you can play around with. What would you suggest, Rich, if people wanted to play with this? Um, I guess, yeah, go, go through your, your, you know, the quick start. Um, I guess there is some documentation on getting started in the Firecracker repo. Um, yeah, it's, it's okay. Um, but um, and I guess there's some really good blog blog posts as well around you know the internals if people are interested in that as well, and some early I, I guess prior art on on you know pushing Firecracker outside of its original usage of you know AWS. Um, yeah, I guess we can share those as well. Yeah, um, as I said, all of the slides and all of the links on the slides are available to my GitHub sponsors. Um, if you have access to the portal and go back to the fifth of March. You can read my deep dive essay, two and a half thousand words, going over um, what I did with it, uh, what I think the use cases are, how you can get started. It's got more on the anatomy of a, a Firecracker VM as well. So if that's useful, head over to github.com uh, forward slash Alex Ellis and you can find out all the details there. Um, now, Richard, where can people find out about what you've been working on showing us today? Uh, so, so Flintlock is currently on the WeWorks um, org in, in GitHub, and that's open source. The, the Cluster API provider is currently closed source, but we are just in the process of creating that whole new uh, GitHub org where everything will be open sourced, and then we can share that um, at that later date. Excellent. Okay. Now, thanks for everybody that tweeted. I'm going to go back through these. I've had some lunch, uh, pick a couple of you and get in touch. So have a look out. If you hear from me, I just need your address and I will get you out a shirt and obviously your size. Cool. Okay. Well, thanks everybody. Uh, thank you, John, Christian. Loads of questions. Really enjoyed it. If you've got suggestions for other things you'd like to see me cover on the channel, other people who would like to come, or if you would like to come and chat with me, uh, get in touch. You know how. All right. We're getting some really nice comments in here from everybody. People said that learn a lot. Great. Well, it's fun. We enjoy it. So very glad to hear that. And now we will play our outro. <laughs>